for college, how to pay for your child's college education with as little out of pocket as possible. And in what I like to call an insider's guide, can you hear me or am I frozen? I can hear you just fine, yeah. Oh, okay, my screen is frozen, but all right, we're moving now, all right. So <laughs> how to go. pay for your child's college education with as little out of pocket as possible, an insider's guide to getting maximum money for college. All right, so keep in mind, this information is based on the current laws and regulations, which keep changing. So that's why we send out a weekly email blast to everybody on our email list, letting them know, like the student loan interest rates you were mentioning just changed like yesterday. Um, so you got to stay on top of that. So who am I? Why are you listening to me? I'll give you a little bit of my story and how I got to be here. So I started out, I went to Syracuse University a long time ago, several decades ago, um, and I went to Syracuse for musical theater. You may not realize, you may not know this. If you're not in the entertainment industry, you wouldn't. Syracuse has one of the top three theater schools in the country. There are more Broadway stars that come out of Syracuse than almost any place else. And at the age of 18, this was my life goal. That's what I wanted to do. So obviously something changed because my stage is a little bit different now. So we'll talk about what happened that turned me from want to be Broadway star to nationally recognized college financial aid expert in just a minute. But I've been doing this over, we've been doing this over 20 years and parents' biggest concerns come up over and over and again. We meet with parents every single day and these are the most common issues they have. Let me know if this is something in the chat. Let me know, hey, that one, this one resonates with me and tell me which one it is. So are you worried about missing the deadlines? There are deadlines for school applications. There are deadlines for financial aid. We have parents who email us, oh my God, is it too late? Did I miss it? Uh, so if that's you, if you're worried about missing deadlines, or if you're not even aware of the deadlines, please make sure and let us know. Number two, making mistakes. This is a huge one. I'm going to show you a statistic later about how many financial aid forms have errors on them every single year. It's astonishing how much money it's costing you. You don't even realize it. Not having the time to do everything involved. My God, trying to get your kid to college can sometimes feel like a separate full-time job. I have parents who are like, I, 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 I don't know how you do it. You, have, you, you guys serve thousands of kids. We, we don't have the hours in the day to do one. And then of course, Chris has already alluded to this, developing a plan to actually pay for college. It's one thing to get them in. It's another thing to get financial aid. And then it's a third thing to go, wait a minute, we're gonna get a tuition bill. How are we gonna pay that? Talking about during something that will hurt their child's chances for college admission. We have a whole separate webinar we could do on mistakes kids and parents make that prevent them from getting in to the schools of their choice. And then things we're gonna talk here about include things that might cause them to not get the most financial aid possible. Our goal today is to teach you how to get free money for college, maximum scholarships, maximum grants, maximum financial aid that you do not ever have to pay back. Why do you need that? Well, I don't have to tell you, college costs are skyrocketing. I mean, tuition, room and board, living expenses, fees, computer and phone. I mean, if you think about it, depending on what type of school your kid goes to, we're talking 100 to 250 to $320,000 at Boston University for just one child. And despite the fact that we've had COVID the last couple of years and some, some of those kids have been stuck in dorm rooms, not able to go into a classroom an entire semester and you still had to pay full price. There was no discounts for COVID. Now, if you have more than one kid, I have three, you multiply, God, I mean, God, best case for that. I mean, if I had all three of my kids go to Boston, BU and got no financial aid, that's $960,000. That's a million dollars and it's gonna keep going up every single year. So how are you supposed to come up with all that money? Again, I was at Syracuse University and here's what happened. Well, it's all thanks to my dad because my first semester freshman year, it was November, I was packing to go home and go visit for Thanksgiving break. It was my first time back home. Well, my phone rang and it's my dad. And I'm like, dad, I'm coming home. I'm gonna see you in a couple hours. And he says, I know, I just gotta tell you something. You can't stay there. I said, no, I'm coming home and then I'm coming back. And he said, no, 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 you can't stay at Syracuse. He's like, I can't afford it. You have to come home. You have to transfer to SUNY Buffalo. I know they weren't, they were on your safety school list and you didn't like their theater department. You have to come home and go there. You have to live at home. You can't live in the dorms. 
you need to get a part-time job and work and you're going to be living at home. So you have to help your mother with the chores. There is no loud music after 9 p.m. And there are no girls over. And he hung up. I called my mother in, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit, I called my mother crying, going, mom, I just got here a couple months ago. I absolutely love it. The professors are amazing. The kids are amazing. This is exactly what I want to do. Like, what is he doing? She said, well, your father just got the tuition bill and he's freaking out, you know, just come home for Thanksgiving. And I'm like, do I need to pack? Do I need a U-Haul? She's like, we'll figure it out. I go home for Thanksgiving. Nobody says anything. 800 pound elephant in the room. I'm like, what do I do? I don't, I'm not bringing it up. And I go back to school and I keep waiting for the go get a U-Haul phone call, but it doesn't come. And I'm like, okay, I guess everything's okay. Until my second semester when my phone rang and my dad said, you can't afford it. You got to come home. You got to live at home. You got to get a job. And I called my mother. I wasn't crying this time. I was still mad. And I called my mom going, I don't understand. I thought you worked it out. Well, your father got a tuition bill. He's freaking out. I'm like, okay. And the third semester, first semester, sophomore year, same phone call. I said, this is going to keep happening. My dad is going to get a tuition bill every semester and freak out. There's got to be a better way. So in addition to pursuing and finishing my theatrical studies, I said, I want to go study how to fix this problem. So there was no degree in college financial aid planning. It didn't exist 20 plus years ago. So I literally had to combine the finance department, the business department, and some other departments to kind of cobble together some studies in terms of figuring out what is wrong with this system and how do we fix it. So um, before we dive in, I would like to ethically bribe all of you to participate in the chat. So if you will answer questions when I ask them, if you will ask questions when you have them, if you will comment and chime in in the chat, it will be more participatory as opposed to me just talking. I will bribe you with a free vacation at the end. You are all parents. I have three kids. My wife works way too hard. You deserve a vacation. Ah, uh, here is where we're gonna send you. So you have to get yourself there, but I will pay for your hotel room. It is a five-star resort. It is in, you have your choice of Orlando or Las Vegas. This is what the balcony in Orlando looks like because I've been there with my family. This is what one of these seven pools looks like in Orlando. And this is my kids in the pool. Don't worry, they're not coming with you. Um, I want pictures when you go. I will pay for the hotel stay. You have to get yourself there. And if you stay till the end, I'll tell you how to get that. So remember, type in the chat, participate. So when people ask me what we do at How to Find Money for College, I say, think about it like this. Has everybody, and we'll start the, we'll start the chat box now, has everybody seen the movie uh, Jerry Maguire? Tom Cruise, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so Tom Cruise was a sports agent, right? And he would negotiate on behalf of the athletes to get them more money from the team owners. So we're like your sports agent without the Varsity blue scandal and without the fake sports. So it's our job to be your kid's agent and negotiate on their behalf, on your behalf, to get more money from the school. And we'll talk about why the schools are deliberately not giving you money in just a minute. So my, my par our parents ask us all the time, show me the money. And I do not yell like that, but it is every time I hang up with a school, I call parents and go, I got you the money. Well, not just me, we have a staff, obviously. So there are, the reason why you're, if you haven't been through this before, if you haven't had a kid in college before, the reason why you're not going to get the financial aid you deserve without help is the schools engage in a process called financial aid leveraging. And you wanna make sure you have paper and pen to take notes because you're gonna get a lot of information. Write down financial aid leveraging, 65% of private schools, and 27% of schools engage in financial aid leveraging is a quote from Money Magazine. What is, yes, I know I talk fast, thank you. What is financial aid leveraging? So every school has an algorithm, a mathematical formula that they use to try and award you as little money as possible and still get you to come. So for example, we'll do an example. So if Michelle, Michelle's here, if Michelle's child is going to Syracuse, which is $70,000 a year now, and 
they can give Michelle's child $10,000 in aid, net cost of 60 grand a year, and Michelle's child will come and Michelle will pay the 60 grand. Now let's compare that to Will. Let's say Will, same kid going to Syracuse, 70 grand retail sticker price, but they have to give, give Will's kid $50,000 a year, net cost of 20, to get them to come. From a financial aid officer perspective, which child is more desirable? Which one's more profitable for the school? Give me your guess in the chat box. You won't be wrong. It's not a trick question. Michelle says her kid, right? The kid that requires less financial aid is more profitable for the school. So again, financial aid leveraging is the process by which universities determine how little aid they can give you and still get you to come. They are literally trying to find the lowest dollar amount they can give you and still get you to show up. Again, that is not me saying that. That is Money Magazine. So five ways to pay to college, pay for college. You're going to want to write these down. Number one is your savings. We're going to talk about all five in just a minute. Number two is loans, which Chris already alluded to. And we're going to talk about those. Number three is scholarships, which is part of what I'm here to talk about. Number four is go to a cheaper school. And number five is skip college altogether. So let's go through all five of those. Number one is savings. If you got that 200 grand burning a hole in your pocket, um, we need to, you need to have a conversation with Chris about where that money is to make sure it is in the right place. If you have savings, I highly recommend talking to Chris and myself because every $10,000 you've saved could cost you $500 to $2,500 to $10,000 in college grant money, depending on how it's held. We're going to talk about ways to, Chris would say elegantly than me, move money so that the colleges can't see it. You need to know what to do before you start playing the college game, unless you're already in it. Michelle says it's hard to save for five kids. Amen to that. All right, number two. Number two was student loans. There are different ways to borrow the money for college. And in our college loan manual that we provide our clients, we literally have a matrix that not only analyzes and explains every federal loan, is it subsidized, is it unsubsidized, is it direct, is it indirect, is it Pell, is it Stafford? We also have a matrix where we've analyzed every private lender in the country. And we analyze them by interest rate, by whose name the loan is in, by when interest starts, by when repayment starts. So you can make sense of all of this. Michelle wants to know, is moving money ethical? Michelle, as long as you do it legally, it is 100% ethical. Um, there, I don't have this quote in the webinar today, but there is actually a very famous judge um, called Judge. His name was literally Learned Hand. And I think Chris has quoted him on the podcast where he talks about, I'm going to mess up the quote, but the basic gist of the quote it, it, it is your job as a citizen to pay as little taxes are as legally possible. There is no reason why you should overpay. And in 20 years of doing this, I've only had one client say, I'm thrilled with my government. I'm happy with how they spend my money. I want, I love this country so much and I'm a little bit ignorant. I want to pay as much in taxes as I can. And I said, they've, you've been really brainwashed. All right, so if you're going to borrow money, and unless you've got that 200, 300 grand from savings, everybody's gonna borrow something. So if you're gonna borrow the money, would you rather get a tax deduction or not get one? Would you rather have a fixed monthly payment or a variable increasing payment? Would you rather have interest-free student loans or high interest student loans? Now, I know these seem like obvious questions. There's a reason I'm asking them. I'm asking them because in 20 plus years of doing this, I have seen parents check the wrong boxes on loan applications and financial aid applications and take the wrong loans. So this is why I'm warning you ahead of time. Would you Do you wanna take a loan out every semester or do you want the funds for all four years available the day before you start your kids start school? It's like that four and a half years, same as cash thing that Best Buy used to do. So you need to know what to do. You need to know the rules of the game before you play. Now let's talk about number three, scholarships. There's different types of scholarships. And we have a whole, I have a whole blog listing the five or six reputable scholarship databases. There are a ton that are scams. I have a whole blog article on how to avoid college financial aid ripoffs. 
because if they say you have to pay to register for the scholarship, it's a scam nine times out of 10. There's a whole bunch of other factors you can read about in the blog that I'll tell you where to go to get later. But here is my first pop quiz question. I'm just curious, you can't get it wrong. Well, I won't hold it against you. What percentage of the $275 billion available in student aid every year comes in the form of private scholarships? Give me a guess on the percentage in the chat box. Participation counts towards the vacation. Kevin says 10%, Michelle says 65%, Chris says 30%, Eric says 30%. Hey, is there another Eric Larson or does this just happen to be the Eric Larson who is my client who I was texting with earlier? <laughs> That'd be funny if we had him in comment. That'd be awesome. Kevin says 25%. All right, we'll talk about the actual answer in just a minute. But if you think about it, it's like Vegas or day trading. Chris, have you ever been to Vegas? I have, yeah. Um, I'll just, one time you went to Vegas, did you win money or did you lose money? <laughs> the first time I net lost, that's for sure. Did you come back and brag to everybody about how much money you lost? Uh, some more, not a brag. I think I did it more as a, as a good story, but definitely not for bragging purposes. Okay. So in the finance, most people, when they come back, no one ever says, I, no one ever admits you're honest, but nobody ever, most people don't admit to losing money in Vegas. Just in the financial aid game, you will find your kids, friends, parents tell you about everything where they got in and the great deal they got. No one says, I didn't get anything. Um, so Number four, number five, you could go to a cheaper school or you could skip college altogether. I'm going to say dislike to both of those. I mean, if college isn't your plan, that's okay, but then I'm assuming you wouldn't be here. So before we get to that percentage number, let's talk about the truth about financial aid. How do they determine if you are eligible? These are some of the myths that most parents have when they come in the door to talk to us. Number one, I make too much money. I won't qualify. It depends on how you make your money, how your money is held, and when you make your money. And I know we need to, we'll get into specifics, but we have literally had clients, our, our, our biggest, I'm going to show you some case studies, but we literally had a client who made $10 million a year that we got financial aid. So it all depends. Number two, my child's not that great a student. That's okay. Your child does not have to have a 4.0 to get more financial aid. It all depends on then if your child isn't a great student, it depends on where is that child applying to school. So if I've got a 2.0 GPA, I'm not applying to Harvard. I'm probably not going to get in. And if I, by some mere, maybe I got in on an athletic scholarship, but I'm not going to get much financial aid there. If I have a 2.0 GPA, I should probably be applying to schools where that 2.0 puts me in the top of the pack. I'm a bigger fish in a smaller pond. I'm a more desirable student. You have to look at it as a marketing campaign. You are trying to market your child to the school. And if the school is filled with 99% of the kids are smarter than your kid, you probably shouldn't apply there. You're gonna have a harder sales pitch to get your kid in and get free money than if they are at least in the middle of the pack as opposed to at the very bottom. We hear this one all the time. Well, I own a house, so I won't get financial aid. That is not true. It depends on what methodology for financial aid the school uses. And there's ways you can search that to find out, will they count my house, my home equity? Because there's lots of schools that don't even care, don't count home equity at all. And then we can talk later about advanced strategies about if I'm going to a school that counts my home equity and I have a paid off house, where can I, Michelle, ethically move and then hide that money, still have it, but not get it counted against me for financial aid. There are ways to make yourself look poorer on paper without losing control of your assets or your money. It's, I love this one. It's a quick and simple process and the college aid officers will help. That is not true. Their whole job, if you remember from earlier, is to give you the least amount of money and still get you to come. Their job is to maximize profit per student, PPS. It's not to help you get your kid there. All right, there is 275 billion of financial aid and tax relief available if you know where to get it, which again, we're gonna talk about where you go to claim your share. So $64,000 question, or if we're talking about a school like Syracuse, it might be the $280,000 question. 
How does your family get your fair share of aid? We need to start with a formula that you want to write down. COA stands for cost of attendance. Cost of attendance is the retail sticker price of the school. Friends don't let friends pay retail sticker price. Now, from the cost of attendance, we subtract something called the EFC. It stands for expected family contribution. This is the magic number that the federal government determines you can afford to pay for college. I'll give you a spoiler alert. The amount they think you can afford to pay is never what you think you can afford to pay. It is always much higher. The expected family contribution, they changed the name of it in the most recent law. It's technically now called the Student Aid Index or SAI, but nobody has changed it in their minds yet. So I take the cost of attendance, I subtract out what I am expected to pay, and that equals family need. Cost minus EFC is family need, which is the amount of aid you're eligible for. Now, then we have to talk about the ways you actually claim that money because the schools aren't just gonna voluntarily give it to you. There are, Michelle says the GI Bill is also helpful. Absolutely, if military is where you are headed, thank you for your service. There are three kinds of families that need proper college funding. Number one, these are families who have a total financial need. They will get financial aid wherever they go to school, but you've got to do it accurately and on time to get the maximum amount of free money. 20 years of doing this, I have had maybe five families out of thousands who had a total financial need just because their EFC was near zero. Families with a partial financial need, those are people who will get financial aid depending on what school they choose and how they position their assets and their income. That's the majority of you attending right now, most likely. And then there are families who do literally make too much money to qualify for need-based aid. However, what you're gonna learn is if you don't go through the need-based financial aid process, you can't get any merit-based money. There's no academic scholarships. There's, I have a kid who got a chorus scholarship. There's no athletic scholarships. We've had a number of those. They can't give you any if you don't do the need-based financial aid forms. I had a call recently. I have a family where the daughter's headed to Yale on a volleyball scholarship. And they were like, we're good. We're, we don't need you. We're, she's getting a, free, a full ride to Yale. I said, well, congratulations, best of luck. Sorry, we couldn't help you. I got a phone call a month later from the dad freaking out going, the volleyball coach just called and said, "There's a we, you never did the financial aid forms. I can't authorize the scholarship because we don't know how much your need is to give you. And he said, we need to get our, our FAFSA and our CSS in in like 48 hours. I said, well, 48 hours is normally way too short. We normally do it like a month ahead of time. We're gonna have to charge you extra for the rush, but we were able to get it done and they were able to get their athletic scholarship. So where do you go to get money for college? There are four main sources of college aid and you wanna write these down and we'll break them down. Number one is the federal government. Number two is your state government. Number three is the colleges and universities themselves. And number four are private scholarships. Remember, I asked that question a few minutes ago, what percentage do you guess comes in the form of private scholarships? And we had answers all the way from 25, 10% all the way to 65%. Are those private scholarships worth it? 2%. 2% of all financial aid comes in the form of private scholarships. So every year, I will tell a crop of parents, don't spend your time looking for breadcrumbs. I had a mom who said, no, no, no. I work from home part-time. I got all this time. I'm going on all your databases. I'm applying for everything my daughter is relevant for. And she spent hours and hours every day. And I said, you're wasting your time. It's not worth it. You could go get a part-time job at Starbucks and make more money. Two weeks later, I got one of them. You didn't know what you were talking about. Like, well, congratulations. How much was it for? Oh, I didn't look at that. Like, go check your email. The scholarship was 500 bucks. I said, how much time did it take you? She's like 20 hours of work, applications, essay, all this other stuff. I said, you could have gotten a part-time job. Um, Chris says, I wasted hours doing the same thing and got nothing. Yes. Uh, Michelle says, is there a way to weed through private scholarships? Yes, I'm going to share those with you. Are there any worth applying for? Yes, we're going to show you all. We're going to give you a source for all of that. 
All right, so where do you start? You start, the most important financial aid form you have to start with is called the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, where the expected family contribution formula is calculated from. Now, the most, you won't get any need or merit. There's two types of financial aid. Need-based is based on your financial situation. Merit-based is based on your child's academics, extracurriculars, athletics, and how much the school wants your kid. You can't get either unless you apply. So you have to fill out the FAFSA form correctly. More than half of all FAFSA forms are submitted with errors every single year. Take a guess in the chat box. What happens if you get something wrong on your FAFSA form? Give me an answer in the chat. <laughs> Kevin says nothing good. That's very specific. Stacy says start over. Well, now we're getting somewhere. So here's what happens. The school will see this. The school will kick you back your FAFSA and say, please, Michelle says go to jail. No, you're not going to go to jail, Michelle. Um, I appreciate your sense of humor. First, we're in the military. Now we're going to jail. Um, so the school will kick you back your FAFSA and say you need to fix it and resubmit. When you resubmit, you go to the bottom of the pile and you start over in terms of your place in line. Here's the thing that most parents don't realize. Financial aid is on a first come first serve basis. It's literally like buying VIP seats at a Justin Timberlake concert. If you've ever tried to do that, I did that once for my wife. I was able to get seats, but literally every millisecond you can see seats disappear because somebody else bought them. And you're like, wait, 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 I want the money disappears if all things are equal and Stacy's child and my child are exactly identical. Our financial situations are exactly identical. Academics, SAT scores, salaries, everything is the same. And Stacy applies on day one of when you're eligible. And I apply three months later. Stacy will get more financial aid than me. So if you want, I can send you a PDF of the worksheet that determines what your expected family contribution is. It's actually 13 pages long. I think I'm one of the only people I know in the business I've been doing, who's actually read the entire thing. There's a thousand page manual that explains it, which I have read every page of, which is how I figured out how we are able to move the needle and save families so much money. So the most, the one thing I want you to write down is the date. The magic date is October 1st of your child's senior year. October 1st at 9 a.m. Eastern time is the day you can submit your FAFSA. Kevin, if October 1st at 9 a.m. is when I am eligible to submit my FAFSA, when should I submit it? I'm going to wait for Kevin to answer. Kevin says 10-1. It wasn't a trick question. Kevin caught on. Awesome. So literally, that doesn't mean I'm going to do my FAFSA the night before. It means I'm going to start a month before. I'm going to get all the data from my tax returns and my bank accounts and the investment accounts. I'm going to have everything filled out and ready to go. So at 10, 1, 9 a.m., I'm already logged into the website and at 01 seconds, I hit submit. I would be willing to bet anyone here 100 bucks that even if you waited two days, couple hours, the first person gets more money. So don't wait. I see too many parents the summer before senior year like, yeah, we'll get to that in September when school starts. Then it's back to school and it's the senior year. So they're busy and crazy and not even thinking about it. And then it's October 17th. And I get a phone call going, oh, shoot, we were supposed to do that, weren't we? Best part is you can have somebody else do it for you. And we'll talk about that later. So how do you apply for aid? Number one, you start with the FAFSA because every school is going to require it. If you are going to a private college, then you need a CSS profile form as well. Michelle says, all the paperwork sounds like applying for a home loan. Michelle, it's worse. So the FAFSA, it's about 130, 160 questions. Now, in the most recent law, the federal government said, we're going to cut it down to 36 questions and make it easier for parents. But Congress can't figure out what questions to cut for the last two years. So it's still like 160 questions. The CSS profile is like 570 questions because private schools ask a whole lot more questions because they're a whole lot more money. Most private schools will want both the CSS and the FAFSA. So you have to do both. 
the FAFSA is going to ask, the CSS is going to ask home equity details, income, assets, expenses. It is worse than applying for a home loan. The important part, if you have a child considering private school, the answers on the CSS have to be the same as on your FAFSA. If there's one decimal point off, one penny off, you typed it too fast, you weren't looking, you weren't thinking, you were trying to get it done, the dog was barking, the other kid was yelling at fighting, my two daughters are fighting with each other, they will kick it back and make you start over. And obviously 567 some odd questions, it can become somewhat difficult to fill out. Now, there are some schools that will make you fill out their own forms on top of the FAFSA and CSS. Again, answers have to match. Um, Kevin, we just completed a small portion and then just uploaded our tax returns. Good method. Maybe. I wouldn't normally suggest that because it's going to auto-populate your IRS data, but it's an automated system. Does that mean it's 100% accurate? Is everything that's on your tax return something you should be reporting? Maybe, maybe not. If not, it's possible we lost out on money. I'd have to look at your FAFSA, your finished FAFSA, and compare it to what it should be. If it's right, then you're fine. If it's not, there's maybe some issues there. Um, if you own a business or a farm, there is a separate business or farm supplement you have to fill out. And if you are divorced or separated, there is a separate forms you have to fill out. Now, let's talk about getting you for free money for college. Not all colleges are created equal. Here is the most, other than your expected family contribution, the second most important number you need to know is called percentage of need met. Remember, it was cost of attendance minus expected family contribution equals family need. Some schools will meet 100% of that need. Others only meet 30 to 50%. Some meet zero. And then the number I want to know after percentage of need met is what's the breakdown? What percentage of gift aid, free money, is that? And what percentage is self-help, which is loans, which we do not count as financial aid, even though the colleges count them. We gave you $20,000 a year in aid. No, you gave me $20,000 a year of loans that I have to pay back. What would you be looking for in the tax form that wouldn't need to be reported? That's a whole separate conversation and unique to your situation. So I can't give you a blanket answer here because Kevin's answer is going to be different than Michelle's. So what most parents don't realize is they get sticker shock looking at a Boston college or a Harvard or a Yale or any private school that's 60, 70, $80,000 a year and say, we can't go there, forget it. What they don't realize is I can get that school to give you, you should be able to get that school to give you a whole lot more financial aid. And oftentimes we can get it to be cheaper than a state school. So I have a child right now, senior right now, who just accepted at American University in Washington. And the parents said, we didn't even think we should tell them to apply. And I said, no, if we look at your numbers, they will give you way more aid. And they put it on the list because it was his dream school. Not only did he get in, but they offered like $60,000 a year of aid, free money. And they're like, wait a second, this is, they're local. They're like, this is cheaper than UB. You, because UB is a state school, offered no money. You are paying retail sticker price at UB. So the even Ivy League schools, we've worked with every single one, often end up, if you do it right, cheaper than a state school. And he's like, well, why would I go to UB for 25 grand if I could go to, let's say, American for 10 and have American on my resume? And I want to go into politics and I could intern on Capitol Hill every summer. That sounds to me a whole lot better. So you need to know the statistics before you even bother apply if it's not too late. We try and work with parents before senior year so that we can affect school selection. Because if I can crunch their numbers now and tell them what to expect in terms of now, I can go look and say, give me your wish list of colleges. Okay, let's cross these off the list because they won't give you any money and you can't afford it. But these schools you think you can't afford actually are more affordable. We will ask them when they make their school list for us to go through, I will say, give me the schools that you would really love to go to, but you've already discounted that you can't afford it because you might hopefully be wrong. So this is, I changed the name, but this is the Jones family. They were looking at ultimately narrowed down to two schools, Northwestern University and Kent State. The cost of Northwestern University, retail sticker price, 
$65,844. Kent State, $25,000. You would think Kent State would be cheaper. Their EFC is $7,878. At Northwestern, they've got a need of $58,000 a year, cost of attendance minus EFC. Kent State, their need is $17,000. Still looks cheaper, except Kent State will only meet 55% of that need and 59% of that meeting of the need is loans. Northwestern meets 100% of their need. So Northwest, they're literally going to Northwestern. They're getting $50,000 a year at Northwestern. They were getting 15 at Kent State. Northwestern ends up being cheaper, the expensive private school. Because again, they have a multi-billion dollar endowment fund. Another thing parents don't realize is college aid is negotiable. Um, I'm hoping that some of you would use, let's say, an infinite banking policy to pay for your next car instead of paying interest rates to the car leasing companies or the finance companies. Well, if you did that, and let's say in five years, you're buying your new car and you're borrowing the money out from your policy, did you walk into the dealer and say, sticker price on the car is 32,000, here's 32,000? Give me an answer in the chat box. Do you pay retail sticker price for your cars? It's not a trick question. I know Chris has taught you better. No, exactly. You negotiate. Kevin says, heck no. Well, it's a typo, but he says, heck no. Right? You look on Blue Book, you look on Consumer Reports, you go in. I mean, some of, I mean, my dad is a real interesting guy. When it comes to car negotiation, he decides ahead of time what he's going to pay, walks into the dealer and goes, I have a certified check for this amount. I'll take that car. Take it or leave it. I'm walking in 10 minutes. If you take it in 10 minutes, you have the check. I buy the car. If you don't want it, if you can't make a decision or you don't, don't accept in 10 minutes, I'm leaving and I'm driving to the next dealership that sells the same brand. Yes, cash should be a better price, says Michelle. So you don't, friends don't let friends pay retail sticker price for cars. You wouldn't let your friend pay retail sticker price for college. If any of you, it's almost like an airplane ticket, right? If you've ever flown on a trip and you talk to the person next to you who, didn't buy the ticket with you and ask them what they paid for their ticket. It's always different. It's never what you paid. Well, when your kid gets to college, go ask their dorm roommate parents on first day, what'd you guys pay? The answer will be different than what you paid. So you can negotiate, but most parents just accept whatever offer they get sent and leave tons of money on the table. Now, remember the financial aid officer's job is to maximize profit. So we advise parents, don't call them crying, going, my kid needs more money. They're trained to resist that. We can work with you and write an appeal that, they will, that, is, emo, that is logical, that will tell them why they're, you're eligible for more money, that has a very high success rate of getting them to say, okay, yes, we'll give you more money. Because again, the early bird gets the worm and most parents never even ask for more money. Why is it flexible? Well, Schools miss award aid packages all the time. There are 19 million students in college. You think they make mistakes? They're human. They under award you, as we already talked about, to try and make more money. And you'd be surprised how many times they will say they do not compete with other school offers. But magically, having another offer from another school with more money very often results if you tell them and getting the other school to up, well, we don't compete with other schools, but we'll give you more money. They have to say that they don't compete, but magically they can find more money. We get asked a lot about section 529 plans, right? Are they all they're cracked up to be? What are the benefits? How do they affect financial aid? So I am kind of controversial in the industry for my stance on 529 plans. So the premise of a 529 plan was, I'm gonna put money away for college, it's going to grow. And when I take it out, I'm not going to have to pay taxes on the gains. Here's the problem, though. If you have money in a 529 plan, who do you think is going to get their hands on that 529 plan money? The college. When you fill out your financial aid forms, you have to declare your 529 plans. And they closed a loophole recently. So if your grandparents have, if your parents, the grandparents have 529 plans, you have to disclose them too. I had to have a conversation with my dad because he says, oh, I started a college fund for the kids. I'm like, 
okay, I need statements. I have to report that. No, 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 this is private. This is just me. My dad has issues. Like he doesn't want to, even though I do this for a living, he doesn't want to share anything about their money, with, about his money with me. I'm like, it, it, this isn't me personally as your son. I am telling you legally, I have to declare it. So the premise was I would get tax-free growth. But what if the school sees that 529 with 50 grand in it and says, um, we want 100% of that because it's for college and this is college. So we're going to cut how much financial aid we're going to give you by 50 grand because you saved that 50 grand. So now I lost $50,000 in financial aid. Well, did the tax-free savings make up for it? No, because let's imagine the average 529 balance is around 50 grand. Well, let's say you were a genius investor and you put away 25 of that and it doubled into 50. Okay, I got 25 grand that I get out tax-free. If I had paid taxes on the 25 grand, it would be long-term capital gains. Maybe I pay four grand in taxes. Would you rather pay four grand in taxes and say and get 50 grand in financial aid? Or would you rather avoid the four grand in taxes and lose $50,000 in financial aid? In 20 plus years, I've had one client who had inherited grandpa, put 300 grand in a 529 the day the kid was born. 18 years later, happened to run into some roaring bull markets in the stock market. The taxes that would have come out were more than financial aid. That, that family was also in the highest tax bracket possible. That's the only time I've ever seen it work. Every other time you end up losing more money in financial aid than you gained in saving the taxes. Um, IP economy, um, do not like 529 plans. When my mom started them, I said, my dad, I said, don't, they said my, they, they didn't have to declare it because they don't know about it. Oh, I personally do not like 529 plans. Um, Michelle, when they started it years ago, you didn't have to report grandparent 529s. Now you do, they changed it in the last two years. So that loophole used to work, now it's closed. Is there a penalty for not reporting a 529? Yes. If they find it and you didn't report it, they can withdraw your financial aid package. Um, they can say, you now owe us an extra 50 grand or however much is in it. Um, yes, there are penalties for lying. So if you own a 529 plan, I'm not telling you to go cash it in. I'm saying, make sure you have a college funding advisor examine it before you apply for financial aid if you haven't already. Now, this is breaking news. President Biden proposed, and I'm not here to talk politics, I'm just here to talk about how it affects college, a massive spending plan that would make good on his promise for free community college. Here's what he's asking for. He's at the American Families Plan, he is asking for $109 billion to make two years of community college education free. So if your kid wants to, needs to start a community college before they transfer to a four-year school, and he gets his way, your first two years of community college, depending on how much money you make, et cetera, could be free. He wants $80 billion to increase the maximum Pell Grant by 1400 bucks a year. He wants 62 billion for retention programs at colleges that serve low-income students. So that's not even scholarships, that's we're gonna spend $62 billion on additional staff to help these low-income students finish their degrees. And he wants $39 billion to subsidize tuition at historically black and minority serving colleges and universities. Who's gonna pay for all that? We are. Taxpayers, yep, Chris is pointing to himself. The plan is likely is facing pushback from congressional Republicans as we speak. Now, the most recent law change before that one is the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 that passed in the last month or two of Trump's term. So I'm gonna give you the good news and I'm gonna give you the bad news. The good news is the majority of the provisions of that law take effect on July, 2023. So this affects the FAFSA, your FAFSA that if you have seniors and that FAFSA is due in three months, those provisions will affect you. So they've increased the Pell Grant to 6,500 bucks. The income protection allowance has gone up 35%. How much income? you can shelter that doesn't count for taxes, I mean, for college aid. The asset protection allowance, which they've been cutting how much money you could shelter, they stopped cutting it. And the bill is also making made modifications to the cost of attendance, otherwise known as retail sticker price. Here's the bad news. 
How many of you type in the chat box if you have, how many if you have more than one child, how many kids do you have? Type in the chat box how many kids you've got. Kevin's got one, Michelle's got five. Chris has eight. Chris, you win, I think. That's that's impressive. I only have three. That's, that's why I still have more hair than Chris. Three kids for Rob. Okay, so here's the bad news for everybody with multiple children. That your EFC used to be divided by how many member, how many kids you had. So if my EFC is thirty thousand dollars a year and I have three kids overlapping in school at the same time. I owe ten thousand dollars. My EFC gets split, and it is ten thousand dollars for each of them. They got rid of that, so that means it. In my case, it triples. So if my EFC is thirty grand, and I've got three kids in college at the same time, my EFC is now ninety thousand dollars. I'm on the hook for ninety grand before anything else kicks in. Michelle says I have the most gray hair. Okay, I can't see you, Michelle. I'll trust you. So, um. We think this is actually wrong. We think the government, he's talking about free college on the one hand, and then on the other, he's talking about doubling, tripling, quadrupling the cost. So we have a petition. I will put the link in the chat box. It is free. We would absolutely love it if you would sign it. Um, we have, let me tell you exactly, we have 61,575 people have signed it. Um, so we're up from when I took that screenshot. Um, we're hoping we eventually get enough that they fix the law. Again, there's a whole lot of laws that apply to this through the Educational Laws Amendment Act, the College Cost Reduction Act, American Recovery and Reinvestment after um, then the American Opportunity Tax Credit, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, and Biden keeps doing more changes to the laws that aren't official bill. He's just stuffing them in other bills and laws. So getting the most money for college, obviously, under those confusing laws is not an easy task. Things you need to know. Will taking advantage of one of a tax provision cost you by reducing the amount of aid you would otherwise qualify for? I have this fight with my wife all the time. She's like, I want to buy a new house. This is our second house. We upgraded when we had our third kid and busted out of our, our first house. She's like, I want a bigger house. And I said, well, and she's like, our real estate market's insane right now. Like you'd have to pay cash. And if you're contingent on the sale of your own home, you're never going to buy. And she said, well, I want to move out of this house into the new house and then sell my house when it's empty because it'd be much easier than want to deal with the pets and the dog and the kids and all that stuff. And I said, yes, that would be much easier. The problem is if I start showing enough income, W-2 income to qualify to, for the bank to let us have two mortgages at once, because I can pay it. It just doesn't show on my tax return that I can pay it because we're keeping our tax rate really low. Well, if I show enough W-2 income to qualify to have two mortgages at once for a month or two, I'm going to totally wreck our financial aid plan. I will suddenly not be eligible for half the financial aid I should be. So you got to know that stuff. Should you take the American Opportunity Tax Credit? Do you make too much money to qualify for the Opportunity Tax Credit? Should you refinance your home to pay for college? I'm hoping that's not, an, not what you need to do, but if it is, you need to talk to me and then you need to talk to Chris about how you structure that transaction so that you don't nail yourself tax wise and so that you don't have issues with financial aid. Because if you need to refinance your house to get cash out, we need to put that cash someplace that they can't see it. Um, if you have to take money out of an IRA, there are restrictions on how you take money out for college. So you gotta be able to answer all of those questions. The way to not become a casualty of the current college laws is to start your planning early, as soon as possible. We do have, every year we get a handful of late stage college planning cases. We have seniors who hire, families whose kids are seniors who hire us. They've already applied everywhere um, and it's help, I gotta do my financial aid forms or help, we got our offers and we didn't listen. We did it on our, on our own and we got lowballed. What do we do now? Um, our, I'll even show you an example of someone who hired us after their kid was already at college. It's not ideal, but we can make it work depending on the case. So you've got to do the proper planning. You've got to make sure your financial advisor and your tax professional, if you have them, are coordinating all of this together, or you have someone quarterbacking everybody so that this all works for you. So if you are going to work with someone on college planning, I'm going to give you a list of questions to ask. Because if you go to 
your regular plain vanilla financial advisor and say, I need help with college, nine times out of 10, they will tell you, put your money in a 529 plan, which we just discussed is not necessarily a good idea. And that's all they know how to do. And it's all they have to sell you because it's a mutual fund investment product that they get paid on. They can't actually do financial aid forms for you. They can actually call any schools and negotiate. Again, your average financial advisors, the majority of them are generalists. You've heard Chris talk about their salespeople in disguise. They can do some retirement planning involving investment products, but that's about it. So questions you need to ask whoever you work with, if you're going to work with someone, can you show me how to lower my expected family contribution so I can maximize my eligibility for aid? Can you help me pick schools that will give me the best aid packages that will meet the highest percentage of need with more free money and less loans? In my ideal world, we start with your kid when they're a sophomore. Juniors average, seniors late, we can do it. Freshman in college is really late. Sometimes we can do it. But in my ideal world, they're sophomores or juniors because I've got time to help them look at majors if they don't know, to help them work with our staff, to help them figure out what they want to study if they don't know, to help them look at what um, um, which schools they should be applying to that they might not have thought of yet. And can someone, can whoever you're working with, whatever company it is, do the FAFSA and CSS forms for you? So you literally don't have to touch it. Um, will they help you negotiate if you get less than you expect or if you get a bad package? Remember, they're going to under-award you. Do you think an emotional parent calling going, please give my kid more money works better? Or do you think an objective professional who is in the business all day, every day speaks their language and is calm and rational and knows why they should give them more money? And it's not just because we really want to go here and can argue numbers with them has a better chance of getting money. Um, can you show me how to pay for college on a tax favored basis if I don't qualify for financial aid, right? If you got to pull money out of somewhere, we got to talk about, are we double paying because we're taking the money out and we're getting nailed in taxes? Now, what if you legitimately, and this happens every year, we have a couple, one or two every year who make too much money to qualify for need-based aid. It's not just about need-based aid. You got to look at merit-based money. We got to look at cash flow strategies, student positioning, appeals. We got to look at merit-based aid strategies. I have a partner um, who is a, we're on the financial aid side. All she does is admissions, is getting your kid into the school and getting as much merit-based like scholarships as possible. So let me share with you some proof that this still works despite the current environment. I'm going to give you some actual examples. So this is a family whose son want, who is now currently at NYU, New York Universities. Michelle says, do rental properties count against you? It depends. Is that rental property in your name? Is it in the name of an LLC? How are you holding it? I see Chris nodding. See, Chris and I speak the same language, right? We do, you know, he's just on a different side of the fence. I'm on one specific area of college financial aid, but he's, all, he's got everything else. Okay, so this family went to New York, wanted to go to New York University. Their expected family contribution before they saw us was $58,530.02 a year. NYU retail sticker price is 74,676. 74 minus 58 is a need of 16,000. Well, NYU doesn't give much money, 56% of need, 75% of that is scholarship. So they were eligible for about 6,700 bucks of financial aid at NYU, which means 74 minus 68, it's gonna cost them $65,000 a year at NYU. We were able to work our magic. You will see that expected family contribution dropped from 58 to 30. We cut $27,956 a year from their EFC. That's $111,000 they don't have to pay. Now, if we do 74 minus 30, all of a sudden they're eligible. Their need is 44,000 instead of 16. So their scholarships and grants went from 6,700 to 18,000. So we tripled these scholarships every year, cut the EFC by 111. So that's about $180,000 of savings. This is our family that's at Boston University. So this is our latest case ever. They called me after they had already sent her for freshman year. 
They didn't do the financial aid forms at all because they had 300 grand and a 529 and figured, well, we're just going to spend the 300 grand. They talked to their financial advisor who referred them to us. They said, well, we're really skeptical because again, we already paid 80 grand the first year. We paid cash. And I said, I'll give you a money back guarantee. Let's see if we can go back in time and work some magic. So their EFC was 26,822. 75 at Boston University minus 26 is a need of 48. Boston will give you 92%, 80% scholarship. So they were they should have been eligible for $35,000 a year in scholarships. Now, remember, they didn't get anything because they didn't bother to fill out the forms. We went back in time, filled out the forms and appealed. We got, this is not normal. Past performance, no guarantee of future success. We got his EFC down from 26,000 to zero. That is not normal. This is abnormally good. So all of a sudden, EFC of zero, $55,000 of scholarships eligible from getting nothing. I will, get, I will read you their letter, which says, we, very, uh, we, our daughter's freshman year, they offered us no financial assistance. Our financial advisor told us to talk to Seth Green and how to find money for college. My wife and I were skeptical because our daughter was already attending the school. We paid 100% of her first year tuition. We talked with Seth, we made the leap of faith and we hired him and his team. Last year, we, last week, we were offered scholarships worth $44,500 per year. Seth and the team cut our cost of college in half. We couldn't be happier. I highly recommend you work with them if you'd like a chance at reducing your cost of college. Now, October 1st, new FAFSA, second sophomore year, we're going after more. I'm trying to get them from the 44 to 55,000. I'm trying to squeeze another 11 grand out of Boston. But they're already thrilled because we cut their cost of college in half. Uh, this is Gail. Gail says, uh, Seth works very hard for his clients, tries to get the most financial help possible, is very approachable, promptly get back to you with updates and answers, always alleviated any concerns we had regarding our college and financial needs. He and his team are wonderful to work with. So what are your options? You can do this yourself. The colleges will love you for it. You will pay more than you have to. You can talk to your accountant. This is really tricky because tax formulas are very different than financial aid forms. It's totally different data. If your accountant applies accounting principles to your financial aid forms, you will destroy the results and you will get way less money than you should. Unless you've got an accountant who literally specializes in college financial aid, I have one as a client of ours because I trained him in how to do financial aid accounting and he is now doing that for his clients. Um, again, their accounts, they're experts in accounting, most likely not financial aid. If you own a business, then your accountant has to get involved to help with the business supplemental forms. Uh, some more questions to ask a college funding specialist. What are they going to do for you? Do they help you do income and asset planning? Do they help you pick the best schools? Will they fill out the forms for you? Will they negotiate with schools? You know, after our appeals process, if the school still hasn't given us as much money as we would like, we are the only firm I know of in the country that literally physically calls every single school to personally negotiate with them. Do they offer any money back guarantees if it doesn't work? Do they... If you ask them, when should you start planning? You should start planning ideally when you got the test results. Not the SATs, the pregnancy test, the EPT. But if you can't start planning 18 years ago, you need to start planning today. And then of course, what's their next step? So the three biggest takeaways I want to leave you with before we wrap up and share with you some more case studies and how we can help if you want, financial aid day, October 1st, 9 a.m. Eastern time. If you're doing this yourself, get your stuff ready weeks ahead of time so that you are ready to just hit submit on October 1st. Um, different schools meet different percentages of need. It's really helpful if you know that before you apply. Financial aid is negotiable. And the bonus, if you're not aware of it, is decision day is May 1st. That's when you have to let the school know, here's my deposit, we're coming. So April, May, two of our busiest months of the year, April, May, and June, because now all my students have accepted and now there's more negotiation to be had. Obviously, other busiest time would be September, October, doing everybody's FAFSA. Um, is there any chance to get aid or scholarships if the school doesn't take federal financial aid? Hillsdale, New St. Andrews. Okay, Michelle, I am not familiar, even though we've worked with over 800 some odd schools, I am not familiar with Hillsdale off the top of my head. I would have to look. Is there any chance to get scholarships if the school doesn't take federal financial aid? Yes, it, de it depends, but yes. The aid would not come from the federal government. The aid would come from the school. 
So <laughs> our mission is to el eliminate your administrative nightmare, which is littered with countless opportunities for errors, causing families to lose some or all their financial aid. We integrate the latest financial aid rules with sound financial planning and tax strategies to help your child attend their dream school and make it a lot more affordable. So is it worth it? Well, Chris asked me to make a brain dead irresistible offer to all of you. So stay tuned and I will share with it what it is and then we'll award our vacation. So we will calculate your expected family contribution for you. We will do it the right way. There are dozens of free calculators online. Most of them are not worth what you're paying, as in they're free. We had a family who husband and wife said, dad said, I did the EFC calculator online. I make too much. We're not going to get any financial aid. We're not coming in to even meet with you. His wife dragged him to one of these workshops. His wife was very smart and dragged him in to meet with me anyway. And she said, let's just hear what he has to say. I crunched, the, we crunched the numbers. His EFC, his actual EFC was half what he thought it was. He said, oh my God, we're eligible for over $100,000 of free money. I said, yes, I told you those free calculators do not work. So we will calculate your expected family contribution the right way. We will run one of, you saw those financial aid analyses that report, we will run one of those on your number one school choice. So we will tell you, here's what the retail sticker price is. Here's how much aid they will give you. Here's how much wiggle room you've got. Here's what it's gonna cost you out of pocket. So you will literally know this is what I'm expecting. We will tell you if we can lower your expected family contribution. We will answer any questions that you have. Now that college cost analysis, we normally charge $197 for. You're not gonna pay that because of Chris. So, but what would, it be, would it be worth it? We have parents who pay that every single day because it's priceless to them to get some of that stress and relieved and some of that peace of mind and know what they're looking at. So if all it did was tell you your EFC accurately, would it be worth 200 bucks? If all it does was tell you how much you're going to pay for your number one school choice, would it be worth it? Well, it's free, thanks to Chris. So everybody type in the chat box, thank you, Chris, because he just saved you 200 bucks. Take him out to dinner. I need to see the thank you, Chris, is in the chat box. There we go. Thanks, Mr. Miles. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Chris says thanks to me myself. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Um, if you end up working with us past that, at the end of that conversation, then you'll have a decision on whether you want us to hire us to help you. There is no sales pressure. We don't work that way. If you do decide to work with us and you're not happy, um, we refund your money. Uh, we have a money back guarantee. I'm going to show with you a couple more examples and then we'll award our vacation. So this is a family. This is our highest EFC ever, $95,126. They were looking at the unit. This is the University of Delaware, which the cost of attendance is 47 grand. Here's a spoiler alert. If your EFC is higher than the cost of attendance of a school and you can't change it, you're not going to be eligible for any need-based aid there. Well, not true because this is Vincent's offer list where DelVal, 25,000 a year, Becker, 19, UMass, 16, Delaware, 15, New Hampshire, 12 grand, University of Connecticut, 22,000 a year. So this is his dad who's going to tell you what he has to say. Our financial advisor referred us to how to find money for college.com. We were skeptical because we weren't eligible for any uh, need-based financial aid. We took the leap and we hired Seth Green and the team. They were able to get us aid at almost every school that our son applied to, including one that was hundred thousand dollars over four years. Uh, Seth and the team helped us cut cost for college. Uh, we couldn't be happier and would highly recommend you work with them if you were looking to reduce your cost for college. Yeah, you're noticing a theme. Everyone is starting to say the same. Everyone's saying the same thing. We were skeptical. We didn't think we'd get any money. And then holy beep, we got money. Um, so we will do your income and asset planning to reduce your expected family contribution as much as possible. We work with Chris on that. We will help you pick schools that will give you the best packages. We will help you fill out the financial aid forms, or if you'd like, and what we'd prefer is let us do it for you. Um, it's just much easier if we, I mean, we have four clients, four families right now who literally can't get any need-based aid because they, I mean, they've been with us for, they literally make too much. Um, it's rare, um, but it does happen. 
and they pay us every year anyway because they have multiple kids. They're like, just do the FAFSA and CSS forms. It's worth it to us just to not have to do it, right? One of them uh, is a partner in her medical practice. Um, the other one is a partner in a very large law firm. He's like, listen, I just don't want to deal with it. I did it once my first year, hated it. I'd rather go get a root canal. I know you're not going to get me any money in my case. I'm happy to just write a check so I don't have to deal with this stuff anymore. So we do have clients who do that. The majority of them, we get money for it, but we do have a few that it doesn't work and we do the paperwork anyway. We will also interview your student and give them access to positioning tools like advice on essay writing, career profiling, college profiling. What's really interesting is your children will tell us things when you're not in the room that they won't tell you. We have the child going to American University for politics. They were in the room a couple of weeks ago. They're local clients here. They came in and I was having the conversation um, with the son and son's like, I really, what, where's your number one choice? You got in at these six schools. He's like, I'd really like to go to American. What do you want to do at American? Political science. Um, do you have any idea what you want to do after American? I'm going to go to law school. Dad's like, I didn't know that. I said, hang on, dad. I said, son, where, why do you want to go to law school? Because I want to run for office. Dad goes, I didn't know that. We had a, that was the conversation about, well, American would be better for you because you could intern on Capitol Hill and at lobbying firms. And that's not going to happen at, let's say, Syracuse, where he also got in. Not going to be the same type of networking available as opposed to Washington, D.C. On the way out, son walks out, mom walks out, dad walks out, comes back, closes the door behind him. So everybody else is out. And he's like, that was like some, these are his words, not mine. He said, that was some Jedi mind stuff you did. I don't know how he, I'm oversimplifying, like the, all the questions I asked him to pull out of him, what he really wanted to do. And when he was telling me that, like he was like looking back, like he was afraid to say it. And he's like, I don't know how you did that. I've been asking him like every other day, what school do you want to go to? Why do you want to go there? What are you going to do with your life? And he just tells me he doesn't know. He's like, that's the first time he's ever answered that question. Now, the most extreme example I've ever had is I had, we had a student who was literally offered division one football scholarships to play quarterback, like that good, full ride at like five or six big football schools. You would know them if I told you. And dad's gung-ho, football, NFL, I'm gonna retire, this is gonna be great. My kid's gonna support me. I'm gonna watch him and follow him around for every game. And we had a conversation when dad was not in the room and his son said, I don't wanna play football. He said, that is all my dad. I said, I don't wanna accept any of these schools. I don't wanna go, I wanna to go to this school that's like last on my dad's list. I'm like, interesting, I know that school for another reason. Why do you wanna go there? And he goes, I'm like, you don't wanna play football. What do you wanna do? And he said, I wanna to go to that school because they have a great musical theater program and I wanna be on Broadway. I said, we gotta bring dad and mom in. You gotta have a conversation because dad is cashing future checks already and dreaming of his new house and his car. And we need to burst his bubble because you could go play football and you might be miserable doing it. Whether or not what you decide to do is gonna be up to you and your parents, but you gotta tell them. And he's like, he was in tears. They were crying. It was like, it was like that was like the first honest conversation we've had in years. That doesn't always, most of the time it doesn't happen, but they will tell us stuff because we are an objective third party adult that they won't tell you. Um, we will negotiate on your behalf to get you the best aid package possible. And we will create a personalized plan every single month for all four years to help pay it in the most cost and tax efficient way possible. So if you're interested in knowing what your aid package might look like before you apply, if you'd like to know if there are any strategies you can take advantage of to help increase your chances and make paying for college more affordable, then you're going to go take advantage of the free offer that is coming to you to save 200 bucks thanks to Chris. Now, I'm going to put my calendar link in the chat box. When you go to the calendar, let me share with you what it looks like and why it's not going to work for you. So I'm going to disclaim that right away. Here's the calendar. You're going to pick college planning consultation because that's me. The rest are other people. It's going to say no times in May. Wait for it. No times in May view next month. And when you get to June, it's going to say that there are like two days at the end of June that are available. So what you're going to do is um, that's how far in advance we are booked. You're going to put in, send me an email and I will put my email 
Seth at howtofindmoneyforcollege.com. You're going to shoot me an email and I will open up separate time slots for each one of you because Chris asked me to make sure that if you wanted that offer, you got to take advantage of it. You didn't have to pay for it and you got to take advantage of it sooner rather than later and not make you wait till June or July. Now, the requirements of that are if you are married, both spouses have to be present. Because if I just talk to mom, she's got to go back and translate me to dad, remember everything, try and go over it with him again. He's going to want to do another call to get his questions answered, which is going to be the same thing as having the first call anyway. So the interest of your time and mine, both parents have to be present. One of three things are going to happen. You're going to get the information you want and you're going to say, that's great. I'm going to go do it myself. That's okay. You will say, I'm going to do some of it. I'd like to talk to you guys about doing some of the other parts for us. Or you're going to say, I don't want to deal with this at all. I want to outsource all of it. How do I just get you guys to work your magic on everything? In which case, we will tell you. There is no sales pressure. You have to ask us to hear about how we do what we do and what we can do for you. We will not try and push you in any way, shape, or form. I do not believe in that. So our average family gets $19,075 per year in college, aid, in extra college aid. Our appeals team increases the average under-awarded package by another $4,809 per year. So now you're up to about $24,000 in savings. You saw some case studies of some people who saved a lot more than that. And we've worked with 822 colleges across the country, including every single Ivy League school. So the link is in the chat. I'm going to leave you with one or two more testimonials. Then we got to give away a vacation. Hi, my name's Helen. And I... Um was referred to how to find money for college by a college roommate, if you can believe that. Um, I hired them to help with negotiating financial aid and um, I found them to be very responsive. They um, always keep me informed about where we are in the process. They explain things in plain English and uh, generally just help me understand what the next steps are and what the best uh, way forward is. So I would highly recommend them to any parent who's looking for support in financing college. All right, so let's give away a vacation. So here's how you get it. When you, when you email me to schedule your time to talk, you're going to also say Orlando or Las Vegas in that email. Those are your two choices. I will then send you a voucher for your free vacation. You have to activate it in 48 hours. You don't have to go. You just have to activate. You have to tell them I'm accepting this free vacation. You have to pay the taxes on the value, which is 50 or something dollars. Um, and then you have 18 months to travel. So if you don't want to travel now because of COVID, you have a year and a half before you have to pick dates and go. So when you email me, you can go on the calendar and try and get those two, two days left in June or the days in July. Um, if not, if you'd like to get in sooner, then again, shoot me an email saying, hey, I'm from the webinar with Chris. I'd like to set up a time to meet with you. And oh, by the way, I want to go to Orlando or Las Vegas. So um, questions. I'll take a breath. Chris, comments and thoughts. Well, this is pretty awesome. I got to say, uh, there's uh, some really good stuff in here. And Got me thinking about uh, you know even my own situation because you know I, I guess my my own perspective and I just had a a, a a podcast come out yesterday about you know whether the government should bail out student loans and such right and uh, my first philosophy my dad never paid for college because he just said hey I'm broke you're on your own good luck had me apply for all those scholarships and he blamed me for not getting any even though I tried you know and that was back in the catalog days what you had to mail yep. everything right it wasn't online. So it was horrible, um, horrible experience. And so I just kind of came up with the philosophy of rather than saying I'm too broke to do it, rather than, hey, my kids, they want to go great. But that being said, even though I, I want my kids to take their own responsibility and I might help with that, I might not, still, if you can give them a leg up, if they're going to have to cover it themselves, why make them pay more? You know, right. why torture them if they don't have to? So I think this is awesome. Um, one question I have for you to go with this, and I know there's another question starting to come in. Uh, who, who tends to get the best results? I mean, is it people that are employees? Are they business owners? Are they people that make more money, less money? Or is it, is it uh, vary? Like what's, uh, where do you see the people get the best results usually? Okay, so that's a multi-part answer. 
So mm -hmm. the easiest expect, so it's a lot of answers. Okay, so I'm gonna start at the beginning. <laughs> so in order to manipulate your expected family contribution, you either need assets you can move or income that you can move. And we don't have time to go into where we move that. And obviously we're big proponents of using Chris and infinite banking to help pay for college if it's not too late for you already. Um, so income you can, assets you can move involves money and savings accounts, but investment accounts, stuff like that. Um, don't go do anything yet until we talk. Income you can move is harder if you are, let's say a W2 employee, right? Husband and wife, both working at other companies that they don't own and they get a W2 for both their paychecks. We're gonna have less ability to change their income. Ability to move income is much easier if you are self-employed or if you own a business. Those people will have the biggest impact on moving their income. However, when it comes to appeal and negotiating, um, that works across, works across the board. So as long as we can present your, I'm a storyteller, we present your financial story and tell it to the college financial aid office in a way that they will respond, then it doesn't matter what you do for a living. It just matters that they bought the story. So in some cases, it's easier to tell that story if they're not as affluent, right? If it's going, I make $750,000 a year, but I really can't afford college. The school is going to say, what are you blowing the 750 on? Why don't you have, you can't save 10% of your income and cover tuition. Whereas if, you know, one of our biggest financial aid wins ever, um, is it son, um, mom, single mother works as a waitress, makes like no money. Um, and we were able to tell that story of hard now kid, it wants to double major, like 4.0 GPA, wicked, super smart, super hard work after school programs, like super smart and hardworking mom, economically disadvantaged, went through some issues that resulted in her being a single mom. And we can tell that emotional story in such a way that the school goes, oh my God, we got to give this kid a break. Um, and he ended up getting an almost full ride. So the answer is it depends. I mean, does it work for the single mom making 10, 20 grand a year? Yes. Does it work for the middle-class affluent? Yes. Does it work for the ultra high net worth, depending on their situation? Because they're most likely probably own a business. Yes. Um, so there is no, it only works if you check this box. Sure. Um, Stacy wants to know, should we hold off filing taxes until we meet with you? Um, that depends. So does that mean, obviously you've got an extension from April. How long does your extension go till? I'm not an accountant and I'm not licensed to give you specific tax accounting advice, but I can tell you how your tax return will affect your financial aid. And if you don't have an accountant, um, we've got one that it, I've trained in our methods that could probably, that, that, that it works nationwide. And I don't make any money sending him your way. Is there Other a look question. back period on yes. the, uh, the assets being moved? Yeah. So for example, if you think about it, if I'm filling out the FAFSA senior year, they're going to look at the last two years of data. Mm. So that's why sophomore year is ideal, because if I move money sophomore year, it won't show up on my next year's tax return. It won't show up on their junior, junior or senior year. It will be gone. Now you can do it after the fact. So if I've got a senior and we move money, they may pay, they may get less financial aid their freshman year, but you have to fill out the FAFSA and CSS every single year. So sophomore year, when the money's disappeared and they can't see it anymore, I can now go appeal and say, we don't have that money anymore and get more financial aid. It's not ideal. Ideal would be doing it ahead of time, but most of the time it works. We've never, we very rarely get a school going, you made that money disappear and we want it back. And that would be the fall of the sophomore year, right? So then you have all yeah. their sophomore, and junior, and then their junior, senior year, those yeah. two years where it's empty. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, again, if you think about it, there's 19 million freshmen a year. They're mm -hmm. not going through all of these things with a fine tooth comb. They don't have the resources. <sighs> yeah. Gotcha. Any other questions before we wrap up? I know Michelle asked about LLCs for real estate properties versus oh, holding your own one. personal name. Um, most likely, yes. I'm not going to give you a legal answer on this. Again, I got to look at your, we got to look at your specific situation. 
But generically speaking, yes, having it in an LLC that wasn't Michelle LLC, it'd be much easier than if it's in you, than your name's on the deed. If it's if it's owned by if you're the sole owner of it, or you and your sister, whoever, your husband or the sole owner of it, we got to count it. So if you had something in your own name and you were trying to transfer it to an LLC, we can talk about that. But again, we've got a time window where the building, where it's going to count. And we can always yep. appeal later when it has disappeared. Awesome. All right. Well, I greatly appreciate you having me on, Chris. I greatly appreciate everybody sticking around. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, most importantly, I hope you implement some of it. And obviously we're biased and we'd love to help you. Shoot us an email. If none of the times in June or July work, if you want to get in sooner, shoot me an email. We'll make time available for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Seth. And again, guys, questions, email them. Seth at, uh, was it how to find money? Shoot. Seth at how to find money for college.com. <laughs> there you go. Seth at how to find money for college.com. Oh, and I forgot. We got it. We had one more question um, that I missed. How to find, okay, so where the blog, where the, our, our scholarship resources and mm. that stuff. If you want, so if you go to how to find money for college.com slash training, you will see a website that looks like this in a video when I had slightly shorter hair. Um, if you scroll down, you will see some of our blogs and the one you want is the how to avoid scholarships or loan scams. You wanna scroll down until you get it because these are our one two, th one, two, three, four, five, six most reputable databases that we have links to that you can click on that. And those, if you search, you can search their databases of scholarships and those scholar, those are legit. Perfect. Great resource, thank you. You are welcome. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, thanks, Chris, for having me. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. All right. We'll see you next time. See ya.